Welcome, welcome. We're uh, just a minute here early, getting started. People coming in. All right, if you guys want to tell us well, where you're tuning in from, um, we'd love to hear it. We'd love to get, get engaged here. We have uh, our special guest, Jay, with us here today. Um, I think Ruben's going to be joining us, and we'll be doing uh, intros here in just a minute. And um, we love questions, so make sure that you guys are, are uh, prepared with questions. If, you, if you'd like, any, any time along the way, both of us here um, will be happy to, to field any questions. While we are presenting, um, we're going to be, Ruben and I, at least myself, will be fielding questions and stuff um, during the, the presentation here. So what we typically like to do is we're going to start with introductions, and we're going to do a really quick demonstration of some of the latest and greatest with Thub stuff very briefly. And uh, then we're going to pass it over to our very special guest speaker here, Jay. Uh, Jay, why don't you go ahead and, and tell us what we got in store today? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Darius. So excited to really dive into some of how you can optimize your mindset to be a successful salesperson. And honestly, it goes for any profession, but I think salespeople have a unique situation and unique uh, profession where it requires a bit more to be able to manage through the challenges of being a salesperson and having been through it and having trained others. Uh, I'm really excited to dive in and provide some practical advice and some deeper understanding as to what it takes to optimize performance without uh, losing yourself, I guess, in the process. Right. Awesome. So before we jump into it, I'm going to go ahead and provide, like I said, a little quick demonstration of the Dub platform. Um, any questions along the way, do not hesitate to reach out, type them into the Q&A. Um, actually, as we go along, any questions we have, please put those into the Q&A. That way they're visible to everybody and we can answer those in live or we can type out the answers. Um, just comments like we're doing now. This is perfect. Tuning in. Uh, we got it, people from, from all over. Uh, Scott, hey, buddy. Welcome back, Iowa. Uh, Mark from St. Paul. Chuck from uh, Houston. Welcome, guys. And I recognize a couple other people in the room here. Uh, Phil, welcome. Marks, a couple Marks. Kevin, hey, guys. All right. So uh, like I said, you're going to start with a little demonstration. Any comments? We love them in the chat. Questions, please, into the Q&A. Okay, here is the quick demonstration we're going to start with. And we're actually going to pull up our uh, guest speaker here is LinkedIn, got a handsome profile. And we're going to do a quick little walkthrough here if my computer will kick in. There you go. Okay, so here's what Dub is in a nutshell. It's a video communication platform for those of you guys that maybe are your first time seeing it. I know many, many of you guys are returning, so you'll be familiar with some of these things. Probably also a couple new things we'll cover very quickly. So uh, what I'm gonna show you first is how Dub records videos. There's a couple new things here for you guys, such as a teleprompter I wanna show you, but uh, Dub is a handful of tools that enables you to record a video from wherever you are. So we're gonna start here in LinkedIn, just as an example. And all I have to do is click this button and make sure I'm logged into Dub. Is in another client's account there. And so there's a handful of recording pieces. The first one is on the website here while the LinkedIn's loading. For those of you that haven't seen this yet, we've added a teleprompter. So this way, when you guys are trying to record videos and you don't know what you're going to say, or maybe you want to write a script for it, you can load your scripts up ahead of time. And when I click record here, it is going to play my teleprompter for me at the speed that I need it to. So you can see here, I can speed it up to where I need it to go and uh, it's gonna go through there, um, the speed that I need it to. So that's new, the teleprompter. This is also available on the mobile app. And back over here, we were trying to show the Chrome extension. So when I click this guy, click one button, and now we're gonna pretend Jay is a client or a customer we wanna reach out to. I could say, hey Jay, just wanted to make a quick video for you here. Um, we actually produced a video that I think you're going to find very interesting. It comes right after this one, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. I re really appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, just kind of a rough example. You'll see why I said exactly what I did, though. There's just some additional options where I can say, this part's really important. I want to show you something about my website or a slideshow 
or maybe something about your website or your business. I can come on here and draw and say, click here, look here, some things like this. And now what happens here, when I'm finished with the video, Dub's actually going to build a little website or a landing page for that video. Now, on the topic of today's call is how salespeople can, can deal on, on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of it's gonna be mindset and utilizing technology is a big part of that as well. Using the technology that enables us to be more effective and more efficient at our job gives us better results, which results in a positive feedback loop, right? We get the results we need, then we get to go back and do it again. So um, here's that little video we made, and here's what Dub does every time you make a video. Dub's going to build a little website based on your goals. So in my case, my goal is to get a booking in my calendar. Dub now offers a direct integration so you can generate appointments just like this. So someone can select a time in your calendar, book a, an appointment with you. They can download attachments, make a phone call, anything you want them to do from the video, these little buttons can do so. There's also a playlist where reach out to. If you heard what I said in the video, I said, hey, Jay, we made a video for you and I'd love to know your opinion on it. And right at the end of that, it rolls into that next video, just like I promised. So this playlist is used to get the best of both worlds, where I can create something custom for Jay in just a handful of seconds, just like you saw, 10, 15 seconds. And then I can leverage my company or my best assets here, my best videos, PDFs, case studies, testimonials, anything you have, you can leverage here on this page to help get you that action you're after. Just like my pages here is set up. It's got social proof, testimonials, success stories, and a little demonstration. These are all designed to get me a booking in my calendar. So you there guys will have Yep. There was a question that Philip had. I wanna make sure that you get to it. He said, how do you make your face show up in a bubble on the video? That's awesome. This is the Chrome extension was the way to do that. So the little dub button right here, this is the dub Chrome extension. And this one enables you to have that picture in picture where you're recording your screen and also including your little bubble right down there. So that's going to be on the dub Chrome extension. Just one of the tools you can use to record. Really good question. Um, thank you for that, Jay. And so this was the second part, customizing your videos. So instead of sending them to YouTube where there's distractions and advertisements and tons of stuff to lose the person's attention, your pages are gonna be optimized and built and branded to keep that attention and drive that conversion that you're looking for. All right, so we talked about how to record the videos, website with the teleprompter, mobile app also has a teleprompter, Chrome extension, you can do picture in picture or you know your little bubble down there. And you can also take any video from anywhere, YouTube or your computer, your cell phone, whatever, and upload those to Dub and Dub's going to do the same thing. It's going to package it up in a little custom website for every single video. So now we have this video. It's perfectly packaged up. It's got everything we need on it, our case studies, a calendar integration, phone call button. Now we're ready to send this video out. And this is actually done through the direct integrations inside of LinkedIn, inside of Outlook, Gmail, any platforms you guys are using, there's that little Dub button built right into it. So all you have to do is click the button, you get access to your library. There's the one I just made for Jay. And then now I can send that through. So that same button exists inside of Gmail, Outlook, LinkedIn, HubSpot, Salesforce, dozens of platforms have that little dub button built right in. So you can share your videos directly through the channels and the methods of communication you're already using. So I'm just showing LinkedIn or Outlook here, little button right there, same function. Give it a click, here's the library, and then you can insert your video just like that. So this is the distribution, direct integrations with your favorite platforms. There's also a universal copy and paste button, any platform, any channel, any CRM, social media tool, you name it. You can copy and paste and send a video through that platform. 
Now, one last piece here, guys, is Dub is actually a full functioning CRM. So like a HubSpot or a Active Campaign or any other CRMs that you're used to, Salesforce, something like that, you have those same exact functionalities here right inside of Dub. So you can take all your contacts, store them in here, keep them organized with filters and lists and tags. You can also market to those contacts. So Dub has built-in bulk sending features. Actually, if you guys got the email from this webinar invitation, this was sent by Dub. So we use Dub to send out bulk video emails and you can do the same exact thing. Using Dub's technology, we can send out either bulk video emails just like this or bulk video text messages. And you're able to see specifically who's watching, who's clicking, what buttons they're clicking. All those things are included. One final piece here is if anyone signed up to Dub in the past six months or so, you will have received some emails and some text messages. Those all come from the Dub platform here. So we don't use other technology to sell and to market Dub. We only use Dub and that, you know, so we drink our own Kool-Aid, practice what we preach, whatever you want to say. But we do this to set an example that it's something you can do for your own business just utilizing Dub. So you've seen emails or texts, maybe both. And those are all coming from these workflows here. So it sends an email or a text, then maybe a delay, then another message. And it could even get complex, like if they click a button, then send them a different message. Or if they watch a video, send them a different email. So that is the very quick demonstration here of the Dub platform and the technology. So anyone that's brand new to Dub, definitely reach out if you have questions here. Um, let me make sure panelists and attendees, Darius at dub.com, be sure to reach out with anything. We're going to be passing it over here to our guest speaker. And um, so if you have questions for Dub trailing along, be sure to, you know, to toss them in the Q&A. But from here on out, we're going to be focused on the training. So um, any questions about Dub, toss them into the Q&A or something. But um, we are going to be moving forward here. I'm going to pass the floor over to Jay. And so all questions related to, to Jay, Jay, I'm going to do my best to field anything that, you know, if it's related, otherwise I'm going to save the questions directed to you for you. So um, here we go. Let's go ahead and I'm going to pass it over to Jay and be quiet. Here we go. All right. Thank, thanks so much, Darius. I appreciate it. And what a, what a cool demonstration The if then branching and having that ability is fascinating. I didn't know Dub had that feature until you showed it. So I appreciate you sharing it and, Excited to be with you all. So let me share my screen here and we can get started. Sorry, I was gonna say just one thing. Our, our uh, founder, Ruben, popped in here with us as well. I, I just wanted to make sure, uh, make him as a co-host. And there you go. All right, I think Ruben wanted to just make an intro real quick. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. Huge shout out to you. Thank you so much for co-hosting this with us. Um, have we gone through the, the kind of housekeeping, Darius? Should I kind of give a reminder on that? No, no, we're, we're all good. Yeah, we're wrapped up. People toss the... Q and A in the Q and A, okay. chat Very in the cool. chat, and yeah, we're all good. I uh, love to always get you know chat messages on what problems you guys are trying to solve because we like to address those live in the webinar. So feel free to do that. And also, what city you're tuning in from? Maybe you've already done it. Thanks. It's all you, Jay. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Ruben. I appreciate it, man. And uh, yeah, so let's dive in, everybody. So I um, I'm excited to to get into today's agenda. What I thought I could start with is, uh, let me just get this going here. There we go. So what I thought I could start with really is first the story about who I am. And um, so you can get some background. Let me move some things here on my screen because I can't see you all see the panel anymore. Here we go. Moving this over. Thank you all for your patience here. All right, now I'm good. And there went my camera. Okay. Technical difficulties. There we go. All right, cool. So a little bit about me. I want to share my story because I think it's important you know uh, who's talking to you and why I should be giving you any of this advice. Uh, so a little background on me. You know, here's a picture of me with my dad, and I'm uh, clearly I'm having a good time here. You could tell uh, I loved my dad, and uh, my dad was one of the best salespeople I ever met. Uh, he he was incredible at sales, and I had the opportunity to learn from him. He was the one who taught me that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And as salespeople, we can all learn to appreciate that as we get into sales. When I was a kid, I said, okay, I don't, uh, I don't know what all that means. And I didn't take it too seriously, but now I, I do really appreciate it. And I'm showing this picture as well, because 
when I uh, really had a change in my life, a transformation in my life, it occurred when my father passed away years ago. So uh, if any of you have ever experienced the loss of a parent or a loved one, you know that that could have a, a major effect on you. And it did for me. It uh, led me down a path of trying to learn how to cope with such a difficult, challenging time, my own emotions and the family dynamic and everything that was going on. Plus, my mortality was staring at me directly in the face, right? I, I had a sense, a real clear experience that life is short. You hear it said, but then when you lose someone, you feel it, you really feel it. And I decided to make some changes in my life. And while at the time I wasn't working in sales, I had sales experience. I uh, was working um, in furniture sales years prior uh, while I was in college. But I decided that if I really wanted a career where I could provide for my family, and uh, at the time I had my daughter and there she is, she's now a big girl, she's nine years old. Uh, but at the time she was much younger. And I thought to myself, I wanted to be able to provide for this little girl but I wanted to do it on my terms where I can make my own schedule to some extent and balance that time with her so I could be fully present with her. So I, I knew that there was an opportunity to do that in sales. I knew that if you were really good at sales, you could be successful financially. And if you did it the right way with the right mindset, you can maintain a healthy balance for yourself. And I, I, I had to learn that through years and years of study and practice and experimenting. And so I took a chance in joining a company named Solar City. Solar City was then acquired by Tesla. And in under four years, I grew from being a salesperson to running the energy sales training uh, program for Tesla. So I was responsible for the development and execution of all training programs and coaching programs for individuals to sales managers to uh, the sales directors as well, <clears throat> as well. So it was leadership development as well. And so that's a little bit of a background on me. And I wanted to share that with you just to give some context as to what I've been through and what I've learned has helped me to optimize my own sales performance on how to optimize the sales performance of others while not working yourself to death without burning yourself out. Because that is a problem we see all over the sales industry. And it's not new, it's been here forever. And it's only seeming to get worse unless we are more proactive about it. So here's the agenda that we have for today. So I'm going to talk to you about the sales mindset that includes adopting mindfulness into your work. And why would I bring up mindfulness? Why mindfulness in general? You know, a lot of people have misconceptions about mindfulness. So what is it really? Is it that esoteric fluffy thing that everyone talks about? Or is there a way in which it can be applied to a sales professional or anyone in the, the professional work environment where it's fast paced and ever changing? So we're gonna be talking about what mindfulness really is in its simplest terms. And then how do you actually practice it? How do you put it into practice so it applies to the work that you do? And some other practical application we're gonna to include towards the end here. So if we have time, I hope we do. Uh, I would love to have some Q&A. At the same time, please feel free to throw any questions into, uh, into the Q&A and also to throw anything into the chat. I'm going to do my best, but Darius, I know you're there. If you need me to uh, answer anything that's immediate, please just feel free to unmute and just chime in. We'll do so, thank you, Darius. So to kick it off with the comments, please go into the comments and I want you to answer this question to the best of your ability. What percentage do you think of US professionals say that their work stresses them out? So throw into the chat, what percentage of US professionals say that their work stresses them out? So I'm looking at some answers now. Darius says 90%, Scott 95, 100, Mark says. I think if people were honest, Mark, they would, they would answer 100. Uh, but I, I feel that. Philip says 90. Mike says 70. Lots of high numbers here. Ruben says 105. Dr. Betsy there says 90%. I think you're all, you're all in the right area, the right arena of the number. And the number, according to the studies that I found, is 83% of people say that their work stresses them out. And I also want to acknowledge that this is assuming everyone's being truthful, like I said a moment ago. But clearly it's a problem that work stresses us out. But this is professionals. 
if we were to do this survey for salespeople, I assume the number would be higher having been in a sales role and having trained uh, over a thousand sales professionals. I know that that number is higher. Now, other stats to share with you on, on sales is these three here, and I'm going to describe each one, 67%, 7 and 81%. Now, this is all studies found specific to sales professionals. There was a survey done to a sales community, and 67% of those who went through this survey said they agree or strongly agree that they are close to or currently experiencing burnout. Two out of every three salespeople, according to this survey, so that they are close to or currently experiencing burnout. Burnout's a big deal, by the way. Burnout means you can't even get up to work in the morning. Burnout means that you're ready to give up. Burnout means you need to take a lot of time off because you can't handle working anymore. And to say that two out of three people say that they're there or close to it is scary. Seven refers to on a scale of one to 10, the average stress level that these salespeople are experiencing. So on a scale of one to 10, the respondents on average said they are at a seven in terms of the stress level. The 81% is from a HubSpot study. That is the percentage of salespeople who say that they work more than 40 hours a week. So just to look into the chat here, who here works more than 40 hours a week? Say, say me, if you're someone who also works over 40 hours a week. <laughs> Yeah, me too, right? It's not that it's not it's necessarily bad. I don't mean to say it's all bad, by the way. It's just the truth, right? We work more than 40 hours a week. We tend to because in sales, it's a requirement. But here's the deal. If not managed effectively, studies show, and this is for over 150 years of research done on the 40-hour work week, studies show that every work, every hour gone beyond the 40-hour work week harms your short-term and long-term productivity. Every hour harms your short-term and long-term productivity because after a full hour, eight, a full eight hour workday, you're exhausted and fatigue sets in if you're not managing, managing yourself effectively. And what's another thing that really caught my eye uh, was by World Health Organization. The World Health Organization recently said that by 2030, they expect that mental health will be the number one disease in the world. So it will surpass all other diseases, will be mental health, having to do with stress, anxiety, depression, burnout, and things like this. So clearly, we are stressed. And the other thing is that we are distracted. So what we find in today's world full of these, right? All, we all carry this with us everywhere we go. We are constantly distracted. There are things that are pulling our attention. And another study, this is by Harvard, suggested that 47% of the time we are distracted. And during that time, we are less happy. The times that we are present, and this is with over 200,000 data points, the times in which we are present, we are happier. We are more fulfilled. I think I saw a, a, something in the chat before that said having to do with purpose. And I agree that having purpose is what helps us to propel forward. And when we are working with purpose, we are present. We are not distracted by other things. I mean, just to ask you all right now, we've been into this webinar for about 20 minutes or so. How many notifications do you have right now on your phone? Go ahead, throw into the chat. Kevin says 15, <laughs> 15 notifications. I'm looking at mine, I have, I have four. I have four right now, eight. Mark says he has eight notifications. How each one, an opportunity to distract you all, right? Each one, 15, eight, those are big numbers. <laughs> Gennaro says 78, right? Phil says one. Chuck, I appreciate that, not looking at your phone. And that's great. And that's a big part of how you're gonna be able to maintain presence. And if we want to operate with being more present, one of the ways in which we can do that is by managing our phones more effectively. And we're gonna be talking about how to manage yourself more effectively. And before we do, I want to clear something up about stress because stress isn't necessarily always bad, is it? There is such thing as healthy stress. So what I mean by that is imagine you go to the gym and every day you're only lifting the lightest weight 
for those who exercise, you know that you're not going to get any growth in your muscles if you're just lifting light weight. Maybe you'll get some, some, uh, some good workout in, but you're not going to see growth. You're not going to see your muscles growing by doing light weight. Now, if you go and you put the weight to where you can just get it up, right? That's a healthy stress. It's a stress just enough to challenge you, to stretch you, but not too much to where it collapses on your chest and you can't breathe. That stress is helpful when you're working in the uh, in sales or any other environment because it's stretching you, it's challenging you, and that's where you're receiving growth in your life. But the stress where it becomes too much and it causes you to fall into states of burnout and depression, that's because of how you're relating to the demand of your work. It all comes down to how you relate to your circumstances. And that's what the sales mindset and transforming your sales mindset is all about. It's how you're relating to it. So I'm going to ask you some questions here. I want to remind everybody, this is a safe place. You know, we're, we, you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to share if you don't want to, but be comfortable sharing if you'd like. Let me ask you directly, why do we get stressed? And I'm referring here to the unhealthy stress. So why do we get stressed, everybody? There's no right answer here, by the way. It all comes down to one thing, in my opinion, but every answer typically brings us to the same spot. But why would you say, in your words, why do we get stressed in an unhealthy way? Okay, Darius says, difficulty meeting goals. Chuck says, lack of perceived control. That's a, that's a deep response, and I really appreciate that, Chuck. Trying to fit someone else's time frame, Feeling that we're not getting anywhere is what Scott said. Yeah, worrying about doing good things. John says, worry, that's a big one. Absolutely. Dealing with things that we can't control. I'm with you, Phil. Russ says, losing control. Absolutely. So the way I see it is everyone is talking about the same thing at the most primal level. At the most primal level, why we get stressed is because of perceived threats to our survival. At the deepest core of you and me and all, all human beings, our behavior tends to be driven by survival and procreation. This is what the scientists tell us. This is what uh, uh, you can, if you really break this down and you observe yourself, you're going to recognize this in yourself, that truly what it is, is a threat to a perceived threat to your survival. That's how your brain is wired. It's wired to survive and to procreate. So if we get into the neuroscience of this and how the brain works, there's this area of the brain called the amygdala. I like to call it the jumpy superhero because it's always looking to come down and save you even when you don't need it to. So the amygdala is perceiving threats, both real and imagined. So if right now you had a bear just break through your wall and start running, you're going to run. The amygdala is going to trigger and you're going to run. And that's a good thing. You want that, right? You want the amygdala to work that way. But the problem is the same area of your brain is reacting when you see that email from a customer that says they're considering canceling. Your brain starts going in the same way, the same reaction, because it's perceiving the threat, whether it's something that's really life-threatening or not. So this is all triggered by two different things, sensory inputs. So that would be the, seeing the bear, right? That would, of course, cause the amygdala to trigger but also your internal dialogue. So the thoughts that you're having are what's triggering the amygdala and tr triggering what you'll see in a moment here, which is your fight or flight response. Because what happens here is cortisol begins to flow through the body and the cortisol that's flowing through your body is triggering what many of you have probably heard of the fight, flight, or freeze response. Like you see this, this gentleman doing here. Now, what's even in addition to the fight, flight, or freeze response, when you're in this kind of state, other brain functions are turning off. So that means your logical thinking, your problem solving, empathy, and memory are shut down when you're in this state. So I want you to think about your career right now. What triggers your fight, flight, or freeze response? So go ahead and throw that in the, in the chat. What triggers the fight, flight, or freeze response for you. And it doesn't mean it's something that you stays with you all day, but could 
affect you throughout the day? What's causing this to happen? What's activating it for you? Take a sip of water here. I got a lot of water. I'm a big water drinker. Daria says fear. Absolutely. And any other circumstances that may arise. Philip says being responsible for many people, many things. That's a, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, Philip. Absolutely. I've been there. Lionel says judgment. Yeah. Judgment of other people, or even sometimes our own judgment of ourselves can trigger this where we freeze up or, or we want to fight, right? We want to fight back against others' judgments. We get defensive. Thomas says uncertainty. Absolutely, Thomas. I feel you. And that's something that, I mean, over the last year, we could all relate to is uncertainty. So much uncertainty over this past year. And even if you think about it at a, at a micro level, I want you to think about when getting an objection from a client, it's hard to be effective if you go into fight, flight, or freeze mode, which is oftentimes what happens because it's a perceived threat to your survival. And I know that this has happened to me. So tell me if throughout the sales your sales career, this has happened to you. Have you ever been in a situation where, hey, you went through the training, you know how to manage all the objections, but when the client objects, you're not sure what to say. Say yes if this has happened to you. Write yes in the chat if you've been in that situation where you did all the training and you're like, the objection comes and you're like, oh, wait, what do I say here? I'm seeing a lot of yeses, Kevin, Mark, Phil. Yeah, isn't that fun? It is funny, Chuck, right? It's funny. And it happens to me even to this day if I'm not primed enough, if I'm not prepared enough. Because as I was saying before, the logical thinking, the problem solving, and the memory in your brain has shut down. So you're trying to think on the fly and for some reason you can't. That's why it's so important for you to be in the right mindset as a salesperson to be able to stay cool, calm, and collected and respond to the objection with the information they're looking for rather than get into that state where you're perceiving a threat. Now, I have a random question for you. You might be like, why the heck is he asking this question? But there'll be a reason for it. Random question. What's your favorite fried food? So go into the chat and tell me, what's your favorite fried food? Are you like a, maybe the fried desserts type of person, some fried Oreos? Um, is it maybe some, okay, I see French fries, Thomas. That's a great one. Chicken, lots of fried chicken here, John. I, I can, you know, I can appreciate that. Fried chicken, funnel cake, uh, or chicken tough call, cheese sticks, chicken wings, fish, fried fish. Yeah, yeah, I can get into some fried fish. I feel you. Chicken wings. Oh, man. Nothing like a good chicken wing. Lemon pepper wings. Lionel's really specific. I love it. So here's the deal, everybody. We can all enjoy fried food every now and then, but imagine that you wake up every day and all you have to eat throughout the day, every day, is deep fried chicken. This is all you eat. From morning, you wake up and it's deep fried, oily fried chicken. So you look something like this every day. Uh, that's you, you're Norm McDonald in this example, right? How would you feel every day if this were you? Describe some of the, uh, the ways in which your, your body would feel, right? You feel bloated, Kevin said. What else? Not good, <laughs> Darius said. You wouldn't feel good, okay? Sluggish, right? Maybe a bit lazy, sluggish beyond belief, depressed, nauseated. Absolutely. All these things are true. I mean, if this is all you were eating, heart attack in a bucket, your energy level wouldn't be great, would it? Well, here's, here's the deal, everybody. In the same way, if you are constantly pouring that cortisol into your body because you are in that constant state of perceived threat, that's the same thing that you're doing to your body, to your health. I, I've seen this so often with salespeople, people like losing their hair right? They don't look the same. They have the bags under their eyes. It's because the stress is just bringing them down. And really at a chemical level, that cortisol is constantly flowing through them in the same way that if you were to eat fried chicken every day, you'd have that kind of response. So something needs to be done. And here's the deal, everybody. This is much more 
important for salespeople because salespeople are much more prone to have these long-term negative effects. So you need to do more to protect against it. So let's talk a little bit more about your brain here. So there have been a lot of studies done on what, how the brain reacts to things like mindfulness and meditation. And we have now brain scans that show us how a brain actually looks before and after. So before anyone, uh, the studies that were done before the subjects would practice any meditation, they would check the size of their amygdala. And then after just a few weeks of practicing, what they saw was a decrease in gray matter in the amygdala. That was the jumpy superhero. It actually got smaller, which is fascinating to think that we can have that kind of change on our brain with a simple practice. And what they also saw was a pathway was created between the prefrontal cortex, and that's the front area of your brain. That's the area of the brain that does more cognitive thinking, more executive functionality. Think of the prefrontal cortex as your the executor at, on your brain. It's like the area of your brain that determines if something is good or bad. It jumps in and says, okay, wait, what's really happening here? It looks at things objectively, okay? A pathway gets created between that and the amygdala. So literally what that means is when you perceive a threat, that area of your brain can jump in and say, wait, what's really happening here? Is this really that bad? Is it as bad as I'm making this out to be? That to me is a fascinating development that they found through brain scans. To be able to jump in, imagine you with that objection, right? Being able to access that area of the brain and be able to avoid getting into that loss of memory and be able to make a clear decision and respond rather than react. And what we also see is increases in gray matter in other areas of the brain. So areas such as empathy, learning, and memory are also developing when someone is practicing mindfulness meditation over a long period of time. And I can tell you, share a quick story with you. One of my clients who, I mean, she was a rock star. I've never seen anybody work as hard as this woman. She was so impressive it, day in and day out getting after it, but it got so bad for her that she was on medication for her anxiety, for depression. I mean, the word burnout isn't strong enough to describe what it was like for her when, when we first met. And after only few, a few weeks, it was two or three weeks, I want to say, of working with her, she no longer needed the medication. She was completely off the medication and still performing at an extremely high level. That's the kind of impact that this has on, on, on a professional. Okay, so the areas of the brain that we're talking about here, by the way, there's two different networks uh, to help you better understand and categorize this for conceptually, there's the default mode network and then the task positive network. So the ta default mode network, DMN, is what's activated when we're daydreaming. So when you're thinking about something you want to do tomorrow or you're reflecting on something that happened in the past, you're not really in the present moment. You're using your default mode network. So I like to think of it as the network that's involved with craving, wanting. You're thinking about something you don't have. Okay, this isn't all bad. Now, when this area is lit up, the posterior cingulate cortex is a central part of the default mode network. It helps you with planning and organizing. So that's not all bad, right? You need to be able to plan for the future. You need to kind of reflect on what happened, all helpful. Now, the negative aspects of this is when they see this lit up in, in patients quite a bit, it's correlated with anxiety, stress, and depression. So the other network, is the task positive network. Now the task positive network is when your attention is on a specific task. So in other words, it's present moment awareness. Think of it like the network that is running when you're in action. There's no past, there's no future, you're there. You're here, you're now, you're present. Now when this is let up, the DMN is, is deactivated. You can't have both systems operating at the same time. It's either one or the other. So when you're fully present and this network is lit up, you're typically doing tasks that feel like time is flying. 
So let me ask you all, throw into the chat, name something that you do that it feels like time flies. It feels like you don't even know what time, like you look up and it, two hours flew by when you were doing this task. And for many people, it could be a hobby, right? So Kevin says playing hockey. That's a perfect example, Kevin. Playing hockey. Chuck says creating art. Video editing, Mark, that's one of mine as well. I feel like sometimes when I'm video editing, I can just get lost and three hours could fly. Gennaro, making music. Darius, writing. So these are things that would be examples of being in a flow state. Chuck says walking the beach. Absolutely. So these are examples of being in a flow state. And for those sports fans, you look at the greatest athletes that, that ever lived or some of the greatest athletes that ever lived, Michael Jordan, Serena Williams, Novak Djokovic, when they're out doing what they're doing, they're clearly in the task positive network. They're not in their default mode network. In other words, they're not thinking. They're not thinking about the next move, the next play. They're, they're right there fully present. And a lot of athletes say this all the time, by the way, what they say is, Hey, when I was out there, I was in a flow state. I didn't even, I didn't even, I didn't even know what, I didn't even think about me is, is essentially what I'm getting at. Like I wasn't there. I wasn't there. It was just the activity. Now that's due to a lot of the practice, but it's because they're so present. Ryan says, when you do what you love, the other stuff seems like pulling teeth. Yeah, I feel you. And that's why these, these players don't ever want to retire, right? That's why Michael Jordan retired, I don't know, 24 times. I don't know how many times he retired. So of course this comes with great practice, but these athletes like Michael Jordan, for example, uh, Kobe Bryant was another one and other great athletes prescribe to mindfulness as a way to get them to be more present to, in other words, access that task positive network. They both use a mindfulness coach by the name of George Mumford. I'm not sure if any of you have heard, uh, he was on the Joe Rogan podcast, I believe, or Tim Ferriss. He was on the Tim Ferriss podcast. And he was talking about how he coaches these athletes to be present on the court so that they don't get caught up in their thinking. Cause as soon as they do, that's where they miss a step. And I like to think of salespeople as these top performers. You are just like these athletes. Sure. You're not physically doing the same kind of things, but it requires moment to moment awareness to be able to respond rather than react. And that requires you to be in a flow state. So the more that you practice these type of things, mindfulness and meditation, I'm going to give you some examples of how to do this. The easier it is to act, to activate your task positive network. So why would you want to activate your task positive network? I mean, you get a few benefits according to scientific study and research, including greater access to flow states, better concentration, less stress, better decision-making, greater, re greater resilience, improved memory and learning, greater levels of compassion, greater adaptability, improved sleep quality, increased vitality, more creativity, improved problem solving, lower blood pressure, reduced chronic pain, improved self-esteem, improved social skills, and uh, improving your overall well-being. So I guess it's not that much. It's not that helpful. But <laughs> I, I, I say all of that because it's the science is there, everybody. The science is there. And um, I, I just, I feel like my heart goes out to salespeople specifically because I know what it's like. And I just, you know, it means a lot to me to share this with you. It really means a lot to me because I, I just hate being, seeing the people who are putting out the greatest amount of energy to work and have the courage to put themselves out there day in and day out and have to hit a quota each month have to be the ones who suffer the most. There's a way around this. So let's play a, a quick game, a quick game. And I'll ask you to comment here. It's not the game called, where are you? It's called, when are you? So when are you, when you are experiencing worry? Are your thoughts in the past? Are you here in the present? Or are your thoughts in the future? When are you, when you're experiencing worry? Kevin says, future, Darius, future. Yeah, nailed it, everybody. Absolutely. You're in the future. And worry, and it was mentioned so earlier as well, worry is such a cause, uh, is, is a wasted energy beyond anything that we could ever experience. There was research done by Cornell University, and it studied uh, people over this long extended period of time. And what they found was that 85% of what people worried about never happened. 
85% of what people worried about never happened. And even, even worse than that, 79% of the people where something that they worried about did happen, handled it better than they thought they could. And they learned something valuable from what happened. So according to the study, when they did all these numbers, it meant that 97% of the time that they had worrying about what it is that would happen, 97% of the time, there was nothing to be worried about. 97% of the time, there was nothing to be worried about. And it reminded me of a quote by uh, this great author. He wrote these great essays, Mich uh, Michel de Montaigne. He said, my life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. And salespeople, we worry. I once worked with a VP at Tesla and he told me that. He said, um, I never forget this. He said to me, the reason why salespeople don't perform is because they spend most of their time worrying about things that don't happen. And I thought that was a fascinating way to think of it because he, he was so true. It was so true. All right, so back to the game. When are you? So when are you, when you're experiencing disappointment, when are you? Are you in the future? Are you in the present? Are you in the past? When thinking about disappointment, when you're, when you're experiencing disappointment, Kevin says in the past, Mark says in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody. So you're right. This is the past, Phil. We're in the past, Thomas in the past. And you know, all of this, I guess, to some extent, Thomas is occurring in the present, but the thoughts are referential, right? They're ruminating about something that's happened uh, not in the present moment. We're going to our memory here and experiencing this disappointment. And of course, this happens all the time with salespeople because we're maybe disappointed that a customer canceled. We're disappointed that we didn't hit our quota. We're disappointed that we didn't get the promotion, whatever it is. But it's all about something that's already happened. But now when we get into things like joy, when are you when you're experiencing joy? And go 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 to your memory here. Like, Whenever you had this joyful moment, maybe it was the birth of your child. Maybe it was seeing something that took your breath away. Where are, when are you when you're experiencing this? So Kevin says present and sometimes past. Yeah, you could, you could have a, a, a joyful memory. Chuck says joy is in the present as well. And, and Phil said the same thing as Kevin, right? Present and also remembering past. Sure, absolutely. But when you have that experience initially, originally, right, you are fully present during the initial experience. Because even if it's in the past, when you had that experience, that was the joyful experience because you were fully present. So joy, pure joy, is only experienced in the present moment. And the same thing goes with flow, as we talked about before. Being in a flow state, the, you know, Game six, NBA finals, Michael Jordan crossing over Byron Scott, hitting that shot. He was in a flow state. He wasn't thinking about the next play or the past play. He was there. So what is this thing called mindfulness anyway? What are we talking about here? Well, I have this definition here that uh, I think makes it really simple. It's maintaining awareness of the present moment, objectively and with acceptance. Maintaining awareness of the present moment objectively and with acceptance. And I'm going to give you an example of this. Say you're a scientist. And you're a scientist and your job is to observe ants through a microscope. Okay? So you're looking through the microscope and you're looking at these ants moving along. Now, as a scientist, you're not judging the ants, are you? You're not saying the ants should be this way or that way. You're not getting annoyed with the ants. You're simply observing them. You're observing them objectively. And you're doing it with acceptance. You're just observing, you're watching their behavior. And in the same way, what we're talking about here with mindfulness as a way to transform your mindset is to maintain awareness of the present moment objectively and with acceptance. And that is awareness of what's happening within you and around you, your own thoughts, your own feelings, your own words, as well as the behaviors of others and the situation around you. So what do you get from this kind of practice? Well, the outcomes, if I were to put it simply into three different buckets, you tap into your awareness. 
you tap into something that you already have, but too often we let get distracted from other things. You also gain insight. And this is so important, everybody. You gain insight into your own patterns. You gain insight into the way in which you normally react to things. You gain insight into your conditioning and you can observe it and then you can change it. You can't fix something that you can't see. It's not possible. And then with acceptance, the third outcome here, you learn to work with your situation, not against it. So in other words, in a conversation with a client, the value that you're, the benefit that you're going to have is to be able to work with the situation rather than to be against what the client is saying. You're not going to fight against or resist what's happening here. You're going to be able to be with it and accept it as it, what it is, and then work to be able to get to the mutual solution that you ultimately want. And what this helps to develop for you is three, what I call faculties or mental strengths. The first one I call space. So what do I mean by space? I'm referring to what I was saying earlier, which is the ability to respond rather than to react. To be able to respond rather than to react. I'm going to just, I saw this note here by Ryan. I'm feeling X right now. It's okay. Feel it, feel it. And it usually goes away. That's a, it's incredibly powerful, Ryan. Yes, exactly. And I have a technique I'm going to share with you later that uh, we we'll realize with time. Yes, we'll get to it. That can help with that exact thing. So I use the word space because I'm a big fan of the book, Man's Search for Meaning by v Victor Frankl. I'm not sure if anyone's read that, but uh, he says, it's a famous quote, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And by adopting mindfulness into your life, you are giving yourself the ability to respond. What you also get is focus. And what I mean by focus is to listen to what the client is actually saying and also what they're not saying because you are fully present with them. Your, your mind doesn't get as distracted. So or, many of you suggested you have a, a way in which you avoid your phone pulling you into different uh, directions here and there and getting distracting you. And I totally appreciate that. Please continue that. And I do the same thing. And for those who adopt this kind of practice, if you are ready, what you also notice is you're now able to focus your attention on one thing at a time and not get lost in your own train of thought. And the last thing here is compassion. I have to say, everybody, I've worked with a lot of people. There isn't a single person not a single person I've met who doesn't beat themselves up to some extent. Not one. Every person I've ever worked with struggles with some form of self-criticism and self-judgment. Write yes in the comments if you've experienced that, if you're someone who's had to deal with that for yourself, right? Where you are beating yourself up, you're judging yourself. I mean, I do this all the time and I watch my own thoughts and you could have done this better, you could have done that better. Like, it's just a constant nagging, right? Ryan says, I'm the worst critic of myself, self-deprecation. Look, first, look into the comments, everybody. You're not alone. Okay, that's the one thing to take, take point of. You're not alone. Everybody goes through this. And if you adopt something like this for yourself, you're going to learn how to give yourself a bit more compassion. And with that, by giving yourself more compassion, you can be more compassionate towards others. You can't give what you don't have. So I'm going to teach you a little bit of how to go about this kind of practice. And so I have a way uh, of bringing it uh, simple for you. This is my friend Ian here. So Ian uh, stands for three steps as to how to go about a proper mindfulness meditation practice. And so it's a bit counterintuitive. Here's what I mean. To this point, you've heard me talk about all the uh, ways in which you can 
get benefits from mindfulness and the goals of, of doing it and how it's going to make you better and self-improvement and all those things, all of which are true. And if you bring that approach into a sitting mindfulness meditation practice, you're going to struggle. Because the idea of mindfulness meditation, and it was said earlier beautifully, which was to really just be with things as they are. It's to be fully accepting of the here and now. And with that, we can't adopt the mindset of, I expect this to be great. I'm going to be so good at this. I have this goal and I'm going to crush it and I'm going to, I'm going to win at meditation. If you go about it this way, everybody, you're not going to find what you're looking for. Instead, what I encourage you to do is set an intention. I intend to be able to relate better to my thoughts and emotions. I intend to be more calm. I intend to manage my stress better. And then let it go. And then when you sit down to practice, you let that go. You can't keep going back to it because then you're in the cycle of doing the thing that you're hoping to avoid entirely in this type of goal setting and this type of attachment. And the second aspect of this is attention. So what I mean by attention is the whole purpose of this practice is to bring your attention to a single object. And then when your mind gets distracted, keyword when, because it will, to bring it back to that object of your attention. Many of you, if you've heard of meditation in the past, you know that breathing is the very, uh, very common one because it's an anchor that's always available to you. So you can observe your breathing. And then when your mind gets distracted to bring it back, you don't have to do breathing. I oftentimes use sound. So I'll be sitting there and I'm listening. Do this with me right now for a second. We don't have too much time, but you can do it as you're sitting with me right now. If you close your eyes and you just get quiet and still and just listen, bring your attention to hearing. You're going to hear my voice. You're going to hear things that are outside of the room, things that are inside of the room. And you can do this for 30 seconds, five minutes, 10 minutes and beyond. And that's a simple meditation practice. And you can do this, of course, with some people do this with a visual object as well. That's, that's fine too. I would encourage you to find what works. And breathing is always a good start. Now, What's going to happen is when you lose your attention, you might get annoyed with yourself, by the way. It's very common. Uh, you might be like, oh, I keep, I keep losing my attention. I, keep, I can't do this. This is not for me. This is not for me. I want you to remember that every time you get distracted and you bring it back to the object of your attention, whether it's your hearing, your breath, or whatever, you just did a bicep curl for your brain. Every time you lose your attention and bring it back, you did a bicep curl. You strengthened the connection to your brain and you're rewiring your brain for focus, for awareness, for space, and for compassion. And the last part about this here is non-judgment. So what I mean is, approach yourself like how you would approach your best friend. To be playful, to not take yourself too seriously, to have a bit of curiosity with yourself. Because as we all said in the comments here, you beat yourself up too much. You need to go through a practice where you're not beating yourself up. You're allowing what is to be as it is. And some people may ask, well, how long do I do this for? I encourage you to just start. Do it for one minute a day to start. Then go for two. Then go up to, to three. And I have some of that information here as to practical application. I know we're close to time here, but I'm going to quickly go through this because I want to give you some, some takeaways. So here are four different things that you can do as practical application to what I just shared with you. And the first one was that formal practice I was just mentioning. And I would encourage you not to find time to meditate. That's not going to work. You won't. <laughs> you won't find time. How could you find time? You're working all you're working more than 40 hours a week. How are you going to find time? You have to make time. This needs to be a priority for you. You make time to brush your teeth every morning. You can make time to make sure that your mindset is set to win the day. Make time. And as I said before, start small, then build. You wouldn't go to the gym the first time and try to lift 500 pounds. Start small and then build it up one minute to two to five to 10 and try to get yourself to 20, 30. That's a great place to be and make it routine. We're habitual human beings. Don't set a specific time 
do it in a specific place and make it a routine for yourself daily. So I'm going to move through this a little quickly, but informal practices are also ways in which you can be more mindful throughout the day. So four, seven, eight is a technique I share with a lot of my clients and it's a simple breathing exercise. So the way it works is you inhale for four seconds, hold for seven and exhale slowly for eight. So you can try this right now with me. So if I were to tell you to right now, inhale for four seconds on the count of three, one, two, three, inhale, hold, exhale slowly. If you just do that three times, you're immediately calming yourself down. Your brain is going to relax, your body will relax, and it doesn't take a lot of time. I feel a little bit more relaxed just after doing it. I would also encourage going out for walks. There's something that's with nature that brings us to the present moment and itself is a mindfulness practice. And I would throw in, as I described those meditations a moment ago, throw in a 30 second meditation every now and then throughout the day. Put it on your calendar as well. Don't expect it to, um, to just happen, Put, place it on your calendar as something that you can do. Now, I'm gonna quickly run through this rise technique. I'm gonna ask Darius, do I have a few extra minutes or do we have to jump? We, we got time here, buddy. We, we, we usually go up to 15 minutes after, so we're good. Okay, I was, I was good thing I asked because I was gonna rush through this. If we have an extra 15 minutes, that, that makes this easier. Thanks, man. Yep. So good thing, I don't have to rush. So I mentioned before, I, I really liked one of the comments mentioned before about, um, feeling what I feel. I think it was Ryan. I'm feeling X right now. It's okay. Feel it, feel it. And it usually goes away. So I want to give you a technique of how you can do just that. So the technique I have is called rise. So when would you use this? You received an email that caused you, that triggered you. You um, are noticing that you're feeling really stressed today, really anxious, you're really overwhelmed. Uh, you received a voicemail from a client and the person was screaming or something, and you want to calm yourself down. Well, the first thing you want to do is R, recognize. Recognize where it is in your body that you're feeling this and allow it to be there. You know, is it in my chest? Is it in my throat? Is it in my gut? My sternum? Where is it? Recognize it. Okay. It's there. I'm going to allow it to be there. And then the second part is inquire. So maintain those attitudes I mentioned before of playful curiosity and self-compassion. Go within it. Where, where is this coming from? Like, what, why am I feeling this way? Not with a criticism of the why, but more of just a curiosity. Why am I feeling this way? What's causing this? And to be fully accepting of what's there. The problem is everybody, we resist it. We push away. We distract. We get to the next thing. We want to avoid. You want to work through it? You want to transform your mindset? Be with it except that it's there. Don't fight it. And the next step, S stands for surrender. And it might upset you to hear that word. I'm surrendering? I don't want to surrender. It's not that kind of surrender. It's not the surrender that I'm referring to where you're, or the surrender that would mean resigning. What I mean is to surrender to the fact that it already happened. There's nothing you can do. <laughs> like it, surrender to the fact that it's your reality. And surrender to the fact that you actually don't have all the specific controls that you think you do. Meaning you can't control the fact that you got angry about something. You might think that you can, but the truth is you can't. You can't control that seeing the client email canceling the order upsets you. You can't control that. So surrender to that reality and remember that it's a feeling. That's all it is. It's a feeling that's in you. It's not you. What do I mean by that? You can't be the feeling because you're the one looking at it. I can't be this clicker here because I'm the one who's looking at the clicker. So clearly there's a distinction between me and the clicker. In the same way, when you feel this feeling inside of you and you're, you're kind of observing it, you're watching it. Well, I, I'm looking at it. I'm not the feeling. And that alone will allow it to effortlessly release. So there's nothing to do here. 
There's no action. There's no activity. But I promise you, if you go through this technique as well as practice a normal, formal meditation mindfulness practice, these things won't grip you like they used to. They won't. The stress, the anxiety, the frustrations, they won't have the same hold on you. So by responding, I'm referring to that space between stimulus and response where you can take a breath here and then be able to respond to the situation. Yeah, Ryan, that's a great point. It's best not to make rash decisions based off of feelings or emotions. And this here, Ryan, and, and for everyone else, this is what I found to be very helpful as to be able to come from a place of intuition, right? And logical thinking rather than reacting from fear and from the fight or flight. And the last thing I want to share with you in terms of practical application is something I'll call mindful listening here. So what I mean by mindful listening is through this practice, what you can do is prime yourself before meeting with your clients, before hopping on a sales call, prime yourself, give yourself a minute or two to prime yourself as the person who is seeking to understand. Prime yourself as the person who is fully present, who will not be distracted. And I'm going to prepare myself mentally to fully focus on the current situation, to be accepting of what is, and to not get caught up in my own fight or flight. So prime yourself. The second thing, and we've talked about it already on this call, but remove distractions, get the phone away, turn off the notifications for the email, be fully present with your clients. And here's something that might sound different than what other people may train you on. Everyone tells you, of course, keep your attention on the client, right? And I totally respect that. And it makes a lot of sense. But if your attention is only on the client, you may lose track of the fact that you got distracted. <laughs> you, may, may, you may forget that while you were focusing on the client, you may have lost your mindful listening. You may have gone into the thinking about what am I going to say next? How am I going to handle this? What am I going to do tomorrow? What do I have right after this? So I encourage you to bring your attention back to yourself every now and then. Observe yourself. Like I was saying before, maintaining awareness of the present moment objectively and without judgment. That is to say, with acceptance, that is to say, bring your attention, observe you. And you're all capable of this. And here's what I mean. You're listening to me right now. Your attention has been on me, which I appreciate. I hope it has. But I want you to right now start bringing the attention to yourself while you're listening to me. You're capable of doing this. I'm doing it right now. I'm talking, but I notice that I'm moving my hands. I'm observing my own facial expressions. I'm hearing my own voice as I'm speaking. It just takes a bit of intentionality. So if you do this right now, you can also experience this for yourself. You're bringing your attention onto you as you're listening to me. And I would invite you to do this with your sales consultations because it will allow you to avoid getting too lost in your own thinking. And to, because the other person will feel it, they will feel your presence. And if you're really struggling, go to your senses. What I mean by that is bring your attention down to your, uh, to your toes, to your body, like fe the feeling. Go bring your attention to your hearing, bring your attention to your face. Oftentimes it has a lot of tension in the face as a way to anchor yourself back to the present moment. Of course, you can do this with your breath as well. And the last thing I'll say about mindful listening is to pause. Pause and be still. The best salespeople I've ever seen have this type of confidence. They don't reply so quickly. They take a moment after you're done speaking, they'll take a moment to digest what was said. And those are the type of people that are portraying a great deal of confidence because they don't need to always be speaking. And that stillness shows authority. It also shows warmth to some extent. 
because you're taking time to really digest what was said. Ryan says, when your partner asks what's wrong, it's better to be honest than say nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Ryan. I agree with that completely. So those were the, the four tips for uh, four ways in which you can practically apply what it is that we discussed today to adopt a formal practice for yourself, to put some informal practices in place so you can maintain a sense of mindfulness throughout the day, to use the RISE technique as a way to manage through when it gets really hard, really difficult, and then adopt mindful listening for when you're speaking with clients or even coworkers. So please throw into the chat, which of these four do you think that you wanna prioritize for yourself? Cause I'm all about action, everybody. If you really wanna make something happen, you have to put it in to uh, apply it. You have to actually embody it. It's nice to learn theory. It's more important to put something into action. So which number would you say that you're going to commit to going forward? Are you gonna look into, maybe you already have a formal practice. So maybe it's one, but to continue it. Maybe it's two to adopt some more informal practices. Daria says, formal practice and mindful listening. Chuck says, I need to practice more mindful listening. I appreciate the honesty. Mindful listening, Lionel says, schedule time for number one and four. Ryan says, all. Mindful listening, Thomas, yeah. One and four, and then need to, need to learn more, Scott. Appreciate that. Kenny says, formal and rise. Excellent, everybody. This is what it's all about. You know, it's, it's great to, to learn things, but I really encourage all of you to, to apply, to practice. Just do try things and see what works. See what works, you know? Don't, and don't believe me, by the way. I should have said that at the beginning. Don't believe anything that I have to tell you. Please try it and then see if it works for you. So I know... Uh, Darius said we have about five more minutes. So I, I do want to leave, open it up for any Q&A. If, if anyone has any questions or did I miss anything, I want to be sure um, I answer them. So yeah, if you guys have questions, now's a great time to ask. Uh, we can actually, if you want, you raise a hand or something, we can bring you up here as a panelist and you can we can turn on your mic if anyone's brave or wants a, a piece there. Go ahead, Ruben. Hey, Jay, thank you so much for that. Uh, can you guys hear me and see me okay? Yes, sir. All right. So, Jay, I really appreciate the presentation. I was really enjoying it, learning, evolving as you were delivering that tremendous information. This is so important for all of us to remember um, about how being mindful is, is, is the key to being happy and how being happy and being balanced and being present is going to help us to, to accomplish our goals. The, the question that I have for you is how can we better embrace the, these beautiful paradoxes that exist. For example, slowing down to speed up. For example, focusing more on people than pipeline. Uh, the, the list goes on, on how we just, if we can contain ourselves, if we can be present, then actually a lot of our problems get solved. It's not about grinding, it's about being. So I, I'd love to, love to understand that from you. Yeah, I love the question, Ruben. Thank you. I would say it all comes down to what's fueling your activity. And what fuels your activity is based off of the intentions that you're setting at the start of your day. So I think it's so important to do that inner work to really know what drives you, what you value, and to always ref uh, refer back to what I would say is like your North Star. Like, this is really what I'm about. This is really who I am. This is really what I value. And every activity that I do today is going to be aligned with that. And then if you're set that way and you've primed yourself that way, then all the activity, the pipeline work and the other things that need to get done, you do them, but it's still fueled by that, by that greater intention and that greater why. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. You know, the way, the way that I see mindfulness is almost like it's a simple tool. And as human beings are developing technology, starting with the wheel and the lever and the pulley and whatnot, um, this is a tool that we've figured out. And some of us choose to use this tool. And unfortunately, most of us do not. So just a word of encouragement and a reminder to invest in yourself, invest in your mental health and connect with people like Jay. You know, Jay, you can connect with him on LinkedIn. Um, his website is right on the screen right here, jayabasi.me. So we yeah, I have it here you. as well. 
Uh, yeah, we encourage, you can email Jay, um, you know, connect, uh, connect with me, connect with Darius. We're here to support in any way that we can. Um, one of the things that I did want to quickly, quickly offer for the attendees, the people that have st stuck around, um, if you, if you've not yet subscribed to Dub and you are considering subscribing to it this week, I, I, we have this cool water bottle right here. Wanted to give this water bottle really helps for hydration. And then this very cool <laughs> dub t-shirt this is mickey it's a dub t-shirt so a little swag pack for anyone that uh, subscribes um just ping us in support channel and we'll kind of know but ping us in the support channel and we'd love to take care of you guys excellent yeah and so i want to just thank you ruben thank you darius for uh giving me the platform here to, to share with everybody and for everyone who's still on please feel free to reach out if uh, there's anything that you feel you could use some help with and where you're at as a sales professional, or if you're going through some, some challenges with stress, some anxiety issues, or you just want to optimize your performance, happy to hop on a quick 15 minute call and learn more about where you're at and help you to get to where you want to be. Awesome. Amazing. And you can, you can reach out to me through jbossy.me. There's a uh, information there to, to schedule a call. Very good. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for attending today's call. Uh, thank you guys for the questions, comments, Scott, Marks, every, everyone that was here. Don't want to do the name calling out, but every, everyone contributed nicely. So thank you guys so much, Jay. I, I'm, I feel better already. Seriously, <laughs> just just the breathing, just the yeah. knowing that there's a tool, knowing that there's a, a way to manage some of this stuff. Um, I'm absolutely applying them today. So really, really appreciate the lessons here. You got it, Darius. Thanks again for having me, man. Appreciate it. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, anything you else, anything else you need, please reach out to either Jay or the Dub team here, if uh, wherever your questions may be related to. So, if anything, uh, don't let your questions go unanswered. Though, reach out, let your voice be heard, and we're here to support. All right. There you go. Okay, guys. Thanks so much. Have a good one. Bye bye.